So a project that's been on my to-do list for the past two or three years now is to make a tap follower. And I'm not talking about following taps, I'm talking more about... Alright, wait a second. Now to put it simply, a tap follower is a tool with a spring-loaded center, which helps ensure that the hole that you're tapping is done perfectly straight. Now keeping it real, most of the holes that I do are good enough to be tapped with a simple taper tap which does a pretty good job at making sure that the hole that I'm tapping is straight. For instance, it doesn't matter all that much if the threads for these tool holder screws are slightly off because it just doesn't matter for a part like this, but there are some other holes where it is very critical that it's done perfectly. Now in the milling machine, I've resorted to applying pressure with the quill and dead center, which does work pretty well, but trying to do the same thing on the lathe is just a lot more difficult. There's a lot less space to work with, and it's just a lot harder to apply constant pressure with the tailstock. Same thing goes for backing off the pressure to allow me to break off the chips. There's a lot of backlash in the tailstock hand wheel, so getting the correct pressure is actually quite difficult. So I thought to close off this short tap making series that I've been doing, I thought it was about time that I finally make a tap follower. So when I was designing the tap follower, at least to me, I felt that it needs to fit at least these three criteria. First of all, it needs to be relatively easy to make, because these tools are often recommended as good starting off projects. It should also suit the setup of the user, and it also needs to suit the type of taps that I use. The taps that I use for instance have centers in each end, which can be used for centering. Now the M3 to M6 taps that I use have a convex center, and the M7 and upwards taps have an internal center. So the follower needs to work with both these types of taps. Now as for the method of chucking, it's going to be entirely up to you. Both my lathe and my milling machine use a number 3 Morse taper, so I'm going to shape the main body around holding it in that sort of setup. Now you may prefer to hold it in a dual chuck for your setup, so you might want to opt for a straight shank, or you can always combine the two and have both a taper and a straight shank to give you a few more options. However, at least for me on my setup, I don't really have the room for a Jacob's chuck and a tap follower, so I think at least for me, a Morse taper design should be a lot more compact and better suit my setup. Now the materials should be pretty straightforward. I have one of those spring kits that you can buy at the hardware store for like 10 bucks, and I should be able to find a combination of springs that works. I've also got a piece of silver steel which I'll use to make the center, and I have a piece of cold drawn steel which I'll use to make the body. You could use a piece of high tensile bar if you really wanted to for the main body, but at least for a tap follower, I just don't think it's necessary. Now before I jump into the machining, I do want to quickly talk about the design of the tap follower. Now I don't think there's one key factor to good design, especially when you're designing a tap follower, but if I did learn something in design class, it's that if you can simplify a design without sacrificing its ability, it's probably a good thing. And okay, what do I mean by that? Well this is a more conventional tap follower that I machined up. And for what it's worth, it's actually a pretty good piece of kit. It should follow taps as good as any other tap follower should. Now it is a little bit smaller than the design that I intend to make. This one here is only a number 2 Morse taper, but it should help convey the point that I hope to make. Now at least in my opinion, at least from a design standpoint, I think it's a little bit more complicated than it really needs to be. The internals work by using this stepped cylinder design, and the step simply prevents the spring tension from pushing the center through the end. And as you'd expect, there's a matching profile inside the main body. Okay, now that's probably a lot easier to see. Okay, so the problem that I see now is that we've created a part that has some pretty tight tolerances that we need to keep to. If we don't do that, there might be a little bit too much slop or wobble, and that might mean the center is a little bit at an angle as it taps the hole. 
So to make sure that this doesn't happen, we need to make sure that everything is perfectly machined. So these two bores need to be a very tight fist on the shaft, which shouldn't be too difficult to make with the reamer, but of course it also needs to remain perfectly concentric. And the same thing goes for the piston. We now need to machine it so that its features are concentric and within a very tight tolerance window, so it has a very nice sliding fit within the bore. Now if you have a four-jaw chuck or even a collet chuck, you can machine in a simple step down by dialing in some stock, that's the right diameter. Or if you're like me and you only have a three-jaw chuck, you'll need to machine in both features from a larger piece of stock, making sure there's no taper in the part either, or that could also throw the part off. Now I'm not saying for one second that this is an impossible task, because obviously I did it right here, but I think there is a much more straightforward approach of doing this with less tolerances that we have to worry about. So before I get the stock loaded, I'll get the compound set up to cut a number 3 Morse taper. I've loaded up a dead center and I'll try and copy the taper using a dial indicator. This is probably the most tedious part of making the tap follower, and if you're not using a Morse taper, you can skip this and make a straight shank. So I'll first get the stock loaded in, and I'll quickly machine in a back step down. Now this part isn't part of the taper, all it does is make the part a little bit longer, so the tailstock screw can eject the part when it's fully wound back. I'll now set up the spray coolant and turn the taper. It's pretty slow feeding in the compound and I don't want to exactly burn up my carbide insert, so the spray coolant keeps everything nice and cool. Now the carbide insert left an okay finish, but I'll clean it up with some abrasive paper. I can now test the fit on a Morse taper sleeve just to see how well I machine the taper. And the two tapers are locking up really well with only minimal pressure. Now I don't have any bluing compound to see the actual contact patch, but given that I can barely see any run out on the part, this should be good enough, at least for a tap follower. And whilst I have everything in its original setup, I'll come in from the back and I'll drill a single through hole. Now to avoid the drill wandering off center, I'm going to be using an almost brand new split point drill. And to finish the hole off, I'll follow it with an extended drill bit. I'll then swap out a drill chuck for a collet chuck, and then I'll bring the hole to its final size, which in this case is 10mm. I can then widen the end so I can then tap it for an M12 screw. And I don't know about you, but a tap follow up would have come in handy just about now. And with all that now done, I can now get the part parted off. And I don't know about you, but that hole looks to be pretty centered. Now if it wasn't, that would have been bad news because that part would have automatically been scrapped. I would have had to come back, remake the whole part, and instead of reaming it to its final size, I would have had to go in with a boring bar just to ensure that everything remained concentric. But thankfully, drilling and reaming seem to do the trick, which is good news for me because it is a lot faster than boring it. Next, I'll remove the chuck and get the part loaded into the spindle.
And that is the main body done for the moment. The next thing I need to do is machine up an end cap. Now the next thing I need to do is get the center made. Now I am holding the stock in the 3 jaw chuck, which is only good enough for about 40 or 50 microns of run out. Now that's not perfect, but it should be acceptable for what I need here. However, it is probably better if you have a 4 jaw chuck and you dial it in and get it done properly. I can now cut the stock to length and get a center drilled in at the other end. The final thing left to do is make a way of retaining the center so the center isn't pushed all the way out the front by the springs. So what I'll do is I'll drill and tap a hole for an M4 grub screw on the main body. And once again a tap follower would have come in really handy right about now. Now the center meanwhile will get a 4mm slot milled into it. Now I am using a milling machine because it is a lot more convenient for me to do it this way, but if you don't have a milling machine, you could simply load an end mill into the chuck and hold the center in a tool holder and feed it in that way. Or I guess if you really wanted to, you could just file in a flat edge on the center. There really is no reason to overthink this design, just pick a method that suits you the most. The final thing left to do is find some springs. And for this design, just tripling up three springs should be enough to get the job done. Nothing else left to do but get it assembled. Now the three springs go in, followed by the center and the screw that holds everything in place. And I don't know about you, but that is a pretty good tap follower. There's a nice amount of preload on the center, and there is a lot of travel too. I measured it, and it comes out to being just under 50 millimeters. And of course, it's also very easy to swap out the convex end for the concave end. It's just a simple undoing of the grub screw and flipping the center. My favorite part though is that the mechanism is housed entirely inside the Morse taper, so it doesn't take up a huge amount of vertical space on the milling machine. Now I do want to point out that I didn't end up hardening the tip. I know some people do do this to avoid wear, but I didn't want to risk warping the part, and for what it's worth, the steel that I'm using here is high carbon, so it's pretty wear resistant, even in its annealed state. And that about does it for the tap follower. Now I'm not about to say that my design is better than anyone else's because everyone has reasons for doing things a certain way, but at least for me I'm really happy how I was able to simplify the overall design but still achieve a really good result. Now of course I did rely on using precision ground silver steel, but this stuff is relatively easy to buy and in 300mm long blanks, it should only cost you about 10 to 15 bucks in this diameter. Overall, not a bad result for an afternoon in the workshop, and you'll definitely be seeing this in future videos. Thanks for watching.